My wife said, you can preach. <laughs> okay, so the topic of today's message is called Peter's Question. Now, that should cause you to think, well, which question is he talking about? He's had a whole Bible full of questions. Amen? Amen. And that's exactly what I want you to do, is to think. Because Peter, remember, he was the one that walked on water. That's right. He was also the one that denied Jesus three times. Uh-oh. He's the one that wept bitterly. He was rambunctious. I think he cut off a Roman guard's ear at one time, too. Yep. So uh, Peter was quite a man, a leader, an apostle. But he had a question for Jesus. And so you're thinking like, okay, let's, let's just go ahead and see what we're talking about here. Do you remember this scripture about the rich young ruler? I know many of you have read and heard of this story before. Uh, Deacon Miles is going to be reading for me today. And could you please read this? Matthew nineteen sixteen. Now behold, one came and said to him, Good teacher, what good thing shall I do that I may have eternal life? That's not the question. So he said to him, Why do you call me good? No one is good but one, and that is God. But if you want to enter into life, keep the commandments. And he said to him, which ones? Jesus said, you shall not murder, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not steal, you shall not bear false witness, honor your father and your mother, and you shall love your neighbor as yourself. The young man said to him, all these things I have kept from my youth, what do I still lack? Okay. Okay. So the reason why I brought this scripture up is because this scripture is leading into Peter's question. And Jesus said to him, if you want to be perfect, go sell what you have and give to the poor and you will have treasure in heaven and come follow me. But when the young man heard that saying, he went away sorrowful for he had great possessions. Then Jesus said to his disciples, Assuredly, I say to you that it is hard for a rich man to enter the kingdom of heaven. And again, I say to you, it is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter the kingdom of God. When his disciples heard it, they were greatly astonished, saying, Who then can be saved? But Jesus looked at them and said to them, With men... This is impossible. But with God, all things are possible. Yes, in Scripture it also says that the rich young ruler walked away very sorrowful. Why? Couldn't he loved the world stuff. more than he did God. That's right. He loved his possessions. They were number one in his life. And it, was, it, it was too difficult for him to give them up. Here's Peter's question. Matthew 19, 27. Peter answered him, We have left everything to follow you. What then will there be for us? What about me, Jesus? What do I got coming? I've left all to follow you. What do I get? Sounds like a legitimate question. Amen? Yeah, amen. But is Peter getting the message here? He's not. He's still in the world. I'm giving up all of this. What are you going to give me? How many of us do that? Yeah. Guilty. I mean, come on, just be real. It happens. So what did Jesus say? Jesus said to them, Truly I tell you that the renewal of all things, when the Son of Man sits on his glorious throne, you who have followed me will also sit on twelve so thrones. So Jesus didn't chastise him. Jesus has understanding. He has love. And he knows where Peter is right now at this particular time. That he's not seeing everything. So when it says, at the renewal of all things, that's the new heaven and the new earth. Amen? Amen. Okay, go ahead. 
You who have followed me will also sit on 12 thrones, judging the 12 tribes of Israel. Well, that sounds pretty good. And everyone who has what? left. And who? And everyone. And everyone. Does that mean you? Yep. Everyone. Don't miss that word. Okay? Jesus was speaking to Peter. Now he's speaking to you. And everyone who has left houses or brothers or sisters or father or mother or wife or children or fields for my sake. For, stop. For whose sake? For my sake. For Jesus' sake. Where are we putting Jesus when we do that? He's at the top. Amen. He's above everything. And that's the way we live our lives. Lord, you're number one in my life. I have my will, but let your will be done. Amen. If I need to go, I'll go. If I need to give everything away, I'll give everything away. But you better be sure what you're telling me to give away there. <laughs> Just being real. But that's where we have to keep Jesus, our Lord and our Savior. Amen. He's our bridegroom. Hallelujah. We're, yeah. We're endowed into him. He says, I go away for a while, but I'm coming back. I want to set you apart from the world. I want to be your bridegroom. You're my bride. And all of you that have ever been married before or married now know what I'm talking about honoring your spouse. Amen. And being faithful and loving and true to your spouse. That's honorable. It's the thing that we're supposed to do. And it's not like I don't need to teach you that. You know that in your heart without anybody saying anything. When you make a commitment to someone. Okay. It's enough about that. And everyone who has left houses or brothers or sisters or father or mother or wife or children or fields for my sake will receive. Will we'll, we'll, we'll receive a what? A hundred times. Okay. As much. Did you catch that? Is that a promise? Yep. It is. Uh, if How valuable is your family? Priceless. Come on. Jesus says, if you put me first, I'm going to give you a hundred times more than that. Because I love you. And how are we supposed to respond to that? Greedily? No. We're to love back. Amen. We, uh, we are to understand how much Christ loves us. And what he's willing to give to us. And do for us. Go ahead. For my sake, we'll receive a hundred times as much. And what? Well, well, don't miss that. There's an and there. There's two things happening. A hundred times as much, and what? And will inherit eternal life. Oh, come on. You're going to give me a hundred times more value than my family, and then you're going to give me eternal life too. Yep, that's what he says. Wow. Red letters. What a deal. What kind of love does the Father have for us? How can we not respond to that? This is the word of God. It's not my word. I'm just letting it flow. And this is an answer, don't forget, to Peter's question. What's in this deal for me? I need to get my own. That was his primary concern. This didn't even touch him yet as to what Christ was talking about. Go ahead. But many who will be first will be last. And many who are last will be first. Wow. What's he talking about? It sounds like Deacon Miles is always giving me answers and riddles. <laughs> Don't ever ask Miles a question because when he gives you an answer, it will be a riddle. And you got to figure out what he's talking about. Hallelujah. Okay. So this is um, Matthew chapter 19, verse 30. The very next verse is uh, chapter 20, verse 1. And this is going to answer Peter's question. In other words, Jesus is going on further to give a parable. What's a parable? It's a story. It's a story. It's an illustration of the truth. Amen. Something that makes it easier for us to understand. Because Peter wasn't understanding. So Jesus gave him a parable so he would. Amen? Amen. And also he gave it to us. 
Peter's question, we have left everything to follow you, Lord. What am I going to get? What do I get for this? Don't I deserve something special? So Jesus here, let me explain this to you. The parable of the laborers in the vineyard. Matthew. Are we laborers? Yep. Okay. Do we work in a vineyard? Yep. What's a vineyard? A it's where we gather a harvest. Amen? Amen. Yeah. Where something's planted, watered, tended to, and grown, and it produces fruit. Okay. Go ahead. Matthew 20, verse 1. For the kingdom of heaven is like a landowner who went out early in the morning. Wait a minute. Stop. I have to point out some things. He went out when? Early in the morning. Don't miss that. Early in the morning. And so what that means at the very beginning of the day, we're talking about 6 a.m. That's the start of the day in Jewish tradition. The work day is what I'm talking about. So that's called the first hour. Go ahead. Went out very early in the morning to hire workers for his vineyard. So actually, he went out earlier than the first hour. He went out with a purpose to hire people. Okay? He agreed to pay them a denarius okay. for the day. A denarius. Did some research on that. That's equal to uh, a Roman soldier's day's wages, which was considered very, very generous. Amen? Amen. So he's giving these workers a very generous offer of employment for one day's work. And what happened? And sent them into his vineyard. So they agreed. They agreed to work for a denarius for one day. Amen? Amen. Because it says a denarius for the day. Okay, go ahead. Verse 3. About nine in the morning he went out and saw others standing in the marketplace doing nothing. Hmm. Huh. And he told them, you also go and work in my vineyard, and I'll pay you whatever is right. So they went. Okay. So this landowner must have had a good reputation. He didn't have to speak anything to these workers. They trusted him. He didn't have to tell them how much. So he just said, whatever's right, I'll pay you. So they said, okay, we'll go to work. Okay, go ahead. He went out again about noon. So nine, he went out, and again when? About noon. Noon, okay. And about, about three in the afternoon. And about three. And did the same thing. And did the same thing. Well, at three o'clock, there's how many hours left in a work day? That's, that's referred to, I believe, as the ninth hour. So work day is from six to six. Go ahead. And about five in the afternoon, five. he went out. And Five in the afternoon, that means there's only one more hour left in the day. Don't miss this. What in the world's wrong with this landowner? Why? I want you to think about this. Why is he doing this? He's got a lot of crop. Maybe. If I had a buzzer, I'd push it. <laughs> <laughs> Go ahead. Verse 6, about five in the afternoon, he went out found still others standing around, and he asked them, why have you been standing here all day long doing nothing? Okay. We already covered that. Keep going. I'm at the bottom oh, where of the are you list. At? What verse are you at? I'm at the very bottom. Okay. So you read verse 6. About uh -huh. 5 in the afternoon, he went out yep. and found still others standing around. Uh-huh. And he asked well, them The day's what? over. Huh? The day's over. That's what I would have said if he asked me. Why are you standing around? Well, the day's over. I'm about ready to go home. Come on now. Why have you been standing here all day? He knew that they'd been there all day. Six in, six in the morning, maybe? Seven in the morning? Whatever time they arrived? They'd been standing there all day doing nothing. Dell, have you ever sat in the labor hall? Huh? And waiting for someone to call you for a job? Okay. And have you sat there and never got a job? Yep. No. Okay. Well, you're blessed. <laughs> you should have said yes just to go along with me. <laughs> so let's say you got hired at 2 o'clock and someone paid you for a full day. How long? Whatever that might be. What would that do to you? 
<laughs> would that make you happy? And would you would it give you good thoughts about whoever was hiring you? Yeah. It'd make you think about that, wouldn't it? Mm -hmm. Sure would. Okay, continue on. Matthew 27, because no one hired us, they answered. He said to them, you also go and work in my vineyard. When evening came, the owner of the vineyard said to his foreman, call the workers and pay them their wages. Oh, hallelujah. Here comes the money. Beginning with the last ones hired. Who were the last ones hired? The ones at five o'clock. That's correct. The ones at five o'clock. Go ahead. And going on to the first. The workers who were hired about five in the afternoon came and each received a denarius. What? For one hour, the landowner paid them a full day's wages, which was a generous rate to begin with, which was a Roman soldier's uh, w rate of pay. Thank you. He sure did. So what? when those who came and were hired first, they expected ah. to receive more. Ah. Okay, get ready for this, you guys. But each one of them also received a denarius. Yes. Oh. So one guy worked one hour got a denarius these guys worked a full 12 hours and they got a denarius so they're thinking well i'm entitled to more than a denarius amen amen because these guys only worked an hour so that means i get more Go ahead. when when they received it they began to grumble against they began the to what grumble uh, against the landowner uh, have you ever been around grumbling <laughs> i sure have I'm on Jesus. I'm on Jesus' side right now. I don't know about you guys. So, giving them a, well, I'm going to get ahead. Go ahead and keep reading. And these who were hired last were only one hour. So I'm going to go back. When they talk, received talk it, talk like them. Come on. When they received it, they began to grumble against the landowner. And these who were hired the last only worked one hour. But you have made them equal to us who have borne the burden of work and the heat of the day. Oh, you whiner. <laughs> <laughs> so listen, they got a point. They, what did they do? They borne the burden of the work in the heat of the day. That's commendable. Okay, I accept that, but let's just stop there. Don't add any more on to it. Where's your heart? So Jesus is saying in this parable, are you a grumbler? Are you a complainer? By him blessing you and bringing something your way, and because someone else gets blessed more than you do, you start to complain? You think that you're entitled to something more than what was offered to you? You know, a servant is a servant. Amen. A servant serves, and he shouldn't get anything more than what is promised to him. Great. That's who he is. He's a servant. You don't get special because you did more than what a servant normally does. That's what a servant does, is does more. Conti Grateful. Oh. Yeah. Gratitude. Really? Do you know gratitude determines your altitude? Amen. 13. But what, he answered them. He I, answered one of them. He answered one of them. I am not being unfair to you, friend. Did he get angry? No. Pastor James would have. <laughs> what the heck are you grumbling about? Take your dinner and get out of here. So what did he say? <laughs> yeah. I'm not being unfair to you, friend. He called him a friend. You're going to grumble, whine, and complain to me? <laughs> Boy, Lord, you're testing me. I want to be like you. I want to be like you. Do you know God sees everything? Amen. Even the grumbling and the whining and the complaining and how you, how you receive that? Amen. That's how we get our character developed within us. Because we know, oh, I need to act like Jesus now. Come on now. How would have Jesus acted in this situation? I'm not being unfair to you, friend. Didn't you agree to work for a denarius? Didn't you? Yeah, happily. Thank you. Matter of fact, generously. 
they're probably only worth a half a denarius. Would have been normal, but they already got blessed. Okay. Take your pay and go. I want to give the one who was hired last the same as I gave you. Yeah. Don't I have a right to do what I want with my own money? Or are you envious how because dare I'm we generous? How dare we consider uh, uh, condemn someone or speak to them in such a manner for them being generous or doing a good deed? What is that doing to you when you start to see someone doing something good for someone else and you're not that someone else? So you start, well, you're doing it for them. Why don't you do it for me? So now all of a sudden, something that's really good, you've taken a good work and turned it back for evil. Uh-oh. So the last will be first, and the first will be last. I'm talking about equality here. We're all equal in the eyes of the Lord. That's right. The last thing that we need to do is put our eyes on others. And there's more there, which we'll cover later. Okay. So, that parable is also talking about eternal life. Because you can come to the Lord when you're 95 years old and be saved. Amen? Amen. And someone who's been saved since they're 16 labored the whole life. The reward's still the same. That's eternal right. life. This is the point that Jesus is making here. Okay. But there's more. Because do you remember that word and? A hundred times? And. And eternal life? Woohoo! So now we're, we're just talking about eternal life here. So remember the thief on the cross? Yep. Okay. Go ahead. Read. Rewards will be given by heaven's standards not earth's standards. Got that? Rewards are given by heaven's standards, God's standards, not yours or mine. Amen. Okay. The last will be first and the first last. Yes. Is what no matter how long or how hard a believer works during his lifetime, the reward of eternal life will be the same given to all. Eternal life in heaven in the presence of God the Father. Stop. Don't miss that. Have you all felt the presence of the God, of the Holy Spirit oh, man. in church? Yes. There's nothing greater than that. And we got to go through this filter, our flesh. And we don't see the Lord with our eyes. But when we come into his presence, we won't be able to even bear it. The love and the holiness is going to be so powerful that we're just going to be blown away by it. And so happy, so complete, so fulfilled. It's all what we're looking for. If we don't get any rewards, just being in his presence and having eternal life with Christ is enough. That's the reward. But Jesus says, no, it's not enough. There's more. It's a hundred times more. Okay, go ahead. Eternal life in heaven in the presence of God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. The thief on the cross, Luke 23, 39 through 43, those whose life of service was limited to a moment of repentance and confession of a faith moment. in Christ. A moment. He was on that cross and he turned to Christ. And he was already on his way out. Never had a chance to walk this earth and serve God. But he ended up where? Heaven. Paradise. Paradise. You're right. Jesus says, "Today you'll be with me in paradise." Woo and the guy, there's three, there's three that were being crucified together. Remember, yep. there's two thieves in Jesus, and the the first thief says, "Oh man, shut up!" You know, and and the, I believe the first thief, if I remember correctly, the scripture says that, well, if you're the king of the Jews, or if you're God, or who you say you are, call us down off this cross. And he's kind of like mocking Jesus. Yeah, save, yeah, save yourself, yeah. So, you're hang what would it feel like to be on a cross? 
Ouch. to have those spikes through your wrists and your toes. Ouch. And I've done some study on it's even hard to breathe. You got to push up to breathe. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. Continue to read. The thief on the cross whose life of service was limited to a moment of repentance and confession of faith in Christ received the same reward of eternal life as the Apostle Paul. Okay. Of course, Scripture also teaches that there are different rewards in heaven for different services. Really? So eternal life isn't enough? Or is it? It's enough. Come on. Where's your heart? It's enough. Being See, if your heart is right, all of this will fall into place. And I'll explain that a little later. Go ahead. But the ultimate reward of eternal life will be achieved by all equally. Look around. These are the people you're going to be spending eternity with. Come on now. Maybe Jesus will get my YouTube and play this one for us all over again. <laughs> I love your humor, you guys. Okay, no condemnation. With the death of Christ on the cross, the destiny of the Christian has been once and for all settled. There is no condemnation for those who believe in Christ, Paul wrote. Can I get an amen? Amen. amen. Is everybody in agreement with that? Yes. Okay, that's a good place to start for the remainder of this message. Continue. Romans 8.1, there is... Here's the proof. There is, therefore, now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Peter wrote, 1 Peter 2.24, He himself bore our sins in his body on the cross, so that free from sins we so might... So that what? Free from sins. Receive that, church. We might live. He paid the price. Do you know sins require payment? Yep. And we could never pay. But the holy, righteous blood of Jesus Christ paid the debt, as it said in the very beginning, once and for all. Amen. Hold on to that truth. Because the devil wants to beat you up. Your own flesh wants to beat you up and convince you whatever you're doing, whatever temptation you might have fallen into, disqualifies you. It's not true. It's a lie. Okay, continue. He himself bore our sins in his body on the cross so that free from sins we might live for righteousness. By his wounds you have been healed. Psalms 103 10 through 12, he has not dealt with us according to our sin, nor punished us according to our inequities. For as the heavens are high above the earth, so great is his mercy toward his what? His mercy toward those who fear him. As far as the east is from the west, so far as he removed our transgressions no from kidding. us. How far Hallelujah. is the east from the west? Okay, so I, fa I found this on, online, and I couldn't help but not um, repeat this quote by Charles Spurgeon. But there's a couple of scriptures that I'd like you to read also. Hebrews 11:6. But without faith it is impossible to please him. For he who comes to God must believe that he is, uh -huh. and that he is a rewarder for those who diligently seek him. He is a what? He's a rewarder. Oh. So Christianity is not a religion. It's a what? Relationship. So are you seeking Jesus Christ in relationship? Yes. Okay. Continue. God is both the rewarder and the reward of his people. Amen. Charles Spurgeon. Yes. Matthew 19.29. And everyone who has left houses or brothers or sisters or father or mother or wife or children or fields for my sake will receive a hundred times as much and will inherit eternal life. Amen. So that was a repeat of scripture discussed earlier. Amen. Amen. And I'm highlighting that verse right now. The, the 
hundred times. Have you ever heard of the judgment seat of Christ? Uh-oh. It's also referred to as the Bema seat. Okay, um, the mercy seat. You know, we're blessed. We do not have to appear before the great white throne judgment to be judged for our sins because as we just saw our sins are forgiven. That's right. But we will have to appear before the judgment seat of Christ. Why? I want to make this clear so everyone understands. I'm going to show you the scripture and go over the scripture that confirms that. Because you're going to be judged, not for your sins, but for your works. What quality they are. And how they come out determines your rewards the hundred times. Okay? Amen. So, go ahead. In the Greek, like English, uses the word judge in two senses. One sense in condemnation, while the other sense is the giving out of rewards. The Bible says unbelievers will be judged in the first sense. The who? The unbelievers. The unbelievers. Okay, go ahead. Will be judged in the first sense, condemnation, while believers will be judged in the other sense, rewards. Okay, keep going. The Bible speaks of special judgment that God will hold for believers only. It is known as the judgment seat of Christ. What are you or, talking about, Pastor James? What do you mean about believers only? That's right. I want you to hang on to this and not forget this. Please. You don't ha you're not going to be judged for your sins. Because the blood of Christ has cleansed you. That's right. From all unrighteousness, never to be remembered before, as far as the east is from the west. Amen. They will not be used against you. God will remember. Don't confuse, because God's God. He doesn't forget. But he promises he won't use those against you in prosecution. They've been cleansed. His son paid the price. And here he's telling us that we get a hundred times and salvation. Well, we already know about salvation. Amen. Amen. We know how, we know if we're saved or not. That's just one part of it, and that's the best part of it, as far as I'm concerned. But he wants to bless you even more by rewarding you. You know what? It's not easy to walk in this world. Mm. It's difficult. It takes a special man or woman to do godly good works. That's right. And he sees everything. Remember those grumblers? Remember those whiners? They don't ever Remember they learn. worked in the heat of the day? And they did a good work? But afterwards, what'd they do? Yeah, I wonder how Jesus thinks about that. Go ahead. The Bible speaks of special judgment that God will hold for believers only. Just a minute. What, what scripture is this? Oh, where are you at? Oh, you're in the I'm, middle I'm, paragraph. I'm, okay. I'm redoing the okay. middle again. Okay. It is known the judgment seat of Christ or the judgment seat of God. Paul wrote 2 Corinthians 5.10. Now, I want you to remember the scripture. Write it down if, you, if this is the first time you've heard this. Go seek it out yourself. Go ahead. For, what, for we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ that each one may receive the things done in the body according to what we have done, whether good or bad. Referring to works, not sins. Therefore, the judgment seat of Christ is not designed to punish believers, but rather to reward them for their faithful service. All of us will give an account to what we have done after trusting Christ as Savior. When? There, when? After huh? trusting Christ as Savior. Do you remember when you first were born again and you received Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior? Uh-huh. That's when your walk began. Okay. Therefore, the judgment seat of Christ is a judgment of believers' works after salvation, Paul wrote. 1 Corinthians 3.10. Here we go. According to the remarkable grace of God, which has given to me to prepare me for my task, 
like a skillful master builder, I laid a foundation. Okay, stop. What's a foundation? It's what I you know these are simple. Like. These are simple questions, but I want to make sure we're all on the same page. Before you build anything, you have to lay a foundation. So why? So it won't fall down and settle. Amen. That's right. Amen. So so continue to read. I laid a foundation, and now another is building on it. Who's that? We are. It's us. Do you know that Paul laid the foundation, and it's called Jesus Christ? And now we're building upon that foundation by our good works. But each one must be careful. Excuse me. I like you sitting in the front row. You encourage me. Go ahead. But each one must be careful how he builds on it. Yeah. Be thoughtful. When you're doing the work for the Lord, make sure your heart's right. Make sure your intentions are right. That's right. You're working for the sake of Christ. Come on now. Not for yourself. You're working for God. And when you have that in your heart, oh, it's a good work. Go ahead. But each one must be careful how he builds on it. Yes. For no one can lay a foundation other than the one which is laid already, which is Jesus Christ. But if anyone builds on the foundation with gold or silver, precious stones, wood, hay, straw. Okay. So we got material in which to build. We can build with gold. We can build with silver. We can build with precious stones. Or we can build wood with wood, hay, or straw. Amen? Amen. That's what the word says. So let's see what the next verse says. Each one's work will be clearly shown. That's you. For what it is. For the day of judgment will disclose it because it is to be revealed with fire. Wow. And the fire will testify the, or test the quality and the character and the worth Don't of miss each that. person's Don't miss that. work. It will test the quality and character. My, my Jesus. I've been preaching character for years. And I'm saying right now, with you all looking at me and with the word of God here, character counts. Amen. That's your focus. Well, you want to look like Jesus in everything you do, not on the outside, but on the inside. Come on now. Go ahead, brother. The fire will test the quality and the character and the worth. Excuse me. So if something is done out of godly character, what do you think the quality would be? should be really good. It'd be, it'd be a precious jewel. Okay, go ahead. The worth of each person's work. But if any person's work which he has built on this foundation, that is, any outcome of its effort remains and survives this test, he will receive a reward. But if any person's work is burned up, by the test, he will suffer the loss of his reward. Yet he himself will be saved, but only as one who has barely escaped through the fire. Barely. Okay. I, I sat, when I was working this up, I started thinking. Barely escaping. That means I'm all singed up in black. But, you know, I can say at least I made it. Yeah, Amen? Woohoo! Yeah. Yeah, but that's, again, will be forever with the Lord. Come on now. Do you see how this is not about your sin? This is about your works. Our, our, we're already in. If you're at the judgment seat of Christ, you're already in. Come on now. Okay, go ahead. Not everyone will receive the same reward. At the judgment seat of Christ, there will be those who suffer loss. Uh-oh. Uh-oh. Have is it, I, this might be a stupid question. Has anybody in here suffered loss? Oh, man. Yeah, it hurts, right? Yep. It's, oh, man. It's a hard one. Go ahead. The judgment will be by fire, 
Fire is used in Scripture as a symbol of judgment. Fire often symbolizes the holiness of God. Can you fool God? Nope. Is there anything that he doesn't know? Nope. Do you think he's a valuable and accurate judge? Yes. Does he judge righteously? Yes. Does he judge fairly? Yes. Does he give grace? Yes. Does he give mercy? Oh, boy. I, that's the kind of judge I want. Yeah, man. I mean, I'd rather go before the Lord before I go before man. That's right. Okay, now, this word shame. Do you know it's in the Bible? Yep. We're not supposed to be feeling shame for anything. But the word says, oh, yes, you are. Go ahead. Confidence, not shame. Without shame, believers want to appear before Christ's judgment seat with no shame, but with confidence. Okay. So we might reflect back on some of the works that we've done. We might not be feeling so confident about them because maybe we had some alternative motives. Or maybe we were a grumbler. Maybe we were a complainer. Maybe we were a whiner. And maybe we had entitlement issues. Yeah. We all know about that. Go ahead. First John 2.28. And now, little children, abide in him, so that when he appears, we may have confidence and not shrink from him in shame at his coming. In what? In shame at his coming. Oh. Okay. Shame. What so, is... Did, has anybody ever suffered shame before? Is oh that a man. stupid question? Yeah, we all know. Yeah. It's not a place to be. Mm -mm. So when we know we're going to go through the... Uh, Pastor James, you're next. What? Okay. I don't want to be up there bowing my head. I, I want to be going, judge me, Lord. I want confidence. I don't want to go in there two-faced. Pretending I'd done something, and really I haven't. It was for something else. It wasn't for Christ's sake. It was for my sake. Okay. I want to be that servant that brings back the ten denarii. Yeah. Second John 1, 8. Watch yourselves so that you do not lose what we have accomplished together, but that you may receive a full and perfect reward when he grants rewards to faithful believers. Scripture. I'm not making this up, church. This is the word of God. We're going to talk about suffering loss. So don't be thinking that, oh, God's so good, I'm not going to suffer any loss. Oh, yeah, you will. If, if you fit the mold, it's going to happen. Go ahead. An illustration of loss. So of in reward. preparing this, I wanted to illustrate what it might feel like or ex what the experience would be like if you actually had a reward and lost it. Go ahead. An illustration of loss of reward could be like experiencing the following. Let's say you have recently built a new two-story house. And while on the second floor... Just yes. How many people value houses? Aren't, have your own houses house is wonderful, isn't it? Man, you, know, you take pride in ownership. You clean it. You paint it. You do everything. You maintain it. That's my house. Okay. Go ahead. So you've recently built a new two-story house. So I got a house. brand new one. I got a designer, an architect, and got this thing set up just exactly the way I want. It's in my dream come true. My dream house. My wife's back there going, yeah. Okay, well, go well ahead. Well, on the second floor, you smell smoke. Uh-oh. And looking downstairs, uh -oh. you see that your first floor is on fire. Oh, no. You jump out the second story window to Ouch. save your life. Yeah. Then you watch your new house burn to the ground. Oh, my. Obviously, you will have mixed emotions. Uh huh. And you're thankful that you were able to jump and save your life, but you're sad because your new house is destroyed. Yeah. This is similar to those believers. Who are saved but have nothing to show for it they've squandered their opportunities to live for Christ yet they're enjoying the benefits of heaven with Jesus
We only get one shot at this, church. It's never too late. Don't squander the things that God has called you to do. Understand that. And get your flesh until it is shut up and sit down. And let your spirit, the Holy Spirit, guide you and work with you. And work according to the will of God. And for his sake, for his kingdom. You know, I see some of you out there on the street doing things for people. And I see some of you inviting people to church. Some of you share the word. That's wonderful. Don't squander. There's things to do here in the church. You know, I've had, I've had um, deacons, honestly. I've had volunteers, I'll put it that way, that whined and complained and moaned because they had to do work. In the house of God. It's a blessing to work in the house of God. That's right. To give of yourself, to give of your time, to work in a ministry, to do something to help the body of Christ. That's right. Because you love Jesus. Mm -hmm. Don't squander away the opportunities. Go ahead. Are we done? We're done. Okay. <laughs> Complaining, grumbling, lack of gratitude. So I kind of hung on to this a little bit, you guys. I'm sorry if I feel like I'm beating you up. But I, I want to point out something. Matthew 20, 10. So then when those who were hired first, they expected to receive more, but each one of them also received a denarius. When they received it, they began to grumble and complain against the landowner. These, in this case, the landowner is representing Jesus Christ. These who were hired on the last worked only one hour. And they said, you have made them equal to us who have borne the burden and the work and the heat of so the day. So what? Get over it. You got what you were promised. Get out of this entitlement stuff. Let go. Rejoice. Be thankful. Have some gratitude. That a blessing has come your way. You but know those guys out there in the marketplace? They were out there because they needed work. They needed money. They had to pay, pay their bills. They had to feed their family. And so God blessed you and brought you some work and helped you. And now you're going to grumble, complain, because you're comparing yourself to whom? The guy that only worked an hour. And the landowner had a heart and a love for people. That's why he went out all those different hours. It wasn't because he needed workers. It was because he was full of grace. Amen. He was full of love. That's right. He was full of kindness. Come on now. He wanted to bless people, just like our Lord Jesus Christ. That's right. So get off your high horse. Stop being a Pharisee. Oh, I'm there, you see. Yes, now. Okay, I'm done. Go ahead. <laughs> These who were hired last only worked one hour, and they said, You have made them equal to us who have borne the burden of the work and the heat of the Again, day. Again, that's a good work, but they just lost their reward. Okay, you with me? That, that, they were due for a reward for that, but they just lost it. They'll suffer loss because they grumbled, complained, and whined about the blessing God brought their way because they were thinking of themselves only, not about their fellow man. Are we not to love our neighbor as ourselves? That's right. Okay. But he answered one of them, I am not being unfair to you, friend. Didn't you agree to work for a denarius? Then take your pay and go. I'm done with you. I want to give the one who was hired last the same as I gave to you. Yeah. Don't I have the right to do what I want with my own money? Get up out of my business. Or are you envious because I'm generous? I love people. I want to help people. Don't condemn me because I'm doing that. Because your eye is evil. You're jealous. You're envious. Keep doing what you're doing, and good things will come your way. That's right. But if you're going to be 
in a place where you don't have any gratitude and God has poured you out a blessing, well, it's going to be a, a little dry spell for you. This is what the Lord says. The reason why I put this scripture up here is so what does the Lord, how does the Lord measure you? How does the Lord measure your good works? Okay, let's make this real clear. We go to the scripture for this. Go ahead and read that, brother. I, the Lord, search the heart, and I examine the mind. He searches the what? The heart. Ah. And examines the mind to reward each person according to their conduct. Amen. According to what their deeds deserve. Okay. Thank you. That's it. There ain't no more. Come on now. Let's give it to Pastor James and the Holy Ghost. Come on. So I did it. I got out of here by one, well, one thirty-five, and uh, they give us a little bit more time to fellowship. And it wouldn't be right if we close without asking if there's anyone that needs prayer. If you feel like you need prayer for this subject concerning your heart and working good works for the sake of Christ. If you need prayer for that, don't be ashamed. Come forward and uh, stand here and we'll pray for you. Not only me, but the whole church. Anyone, come. The altar is open. Come and stand before your Lord. Sister uh, Deaconess Karen, could you come up here and pray? Put your hands on the women gently. Okay. Church, raise your hands. Stretch them forward. Please be in agreement with me. You know what? I, I'm just going to take a minute. It takes, oh, I can't say that. It takes courage to come up front and receive prayer in front of your family. We all want to project that I got it all together. Well, we know the answer to that. So we're going to pray for our brothers and sisters right now that want to have a heart, more of a heart, to do their work for the Lord and not for self. Does that sound about right? Okay. So, Father, I come to you now in the mighty name of Jesus. As I touch each brother and sister, I ask that you put a special anointing on them, that you soften and tenderize their heart that they can't just stop thinking about you, about every movement, everything, every word is going to be about you in the name of Jesus, that you are blessing your children as they come forward to receive from you. And we love them. And we know that you hear our prayer today. And I ask you, Lord, to pour yourself out in these brothers and sisters' hearts. And the ones that came up to support we got hands on. Talk to them, Lord. Speak to them. Help them. Strengthen them. Encourage them. I speak to the church. All the ones that maybe thought about coming up and wish they came up but didn't, or sitting in the chair believing that they can receive the same blessing, well, you can't. So I pray over all of them right now, Lord, that receive this message that you would put into their hearts the goodness of God in such a way they can't sit still. And it's love them. We say and pray these things in the mighty name of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. We all say? Amen. Amen. You may be seated. You can stay there, Margo, if you wish. So, 
And during this sermon, guess what? You get a reward. It's called food. <laughs> so we're going to, as, as our custom is, uh, Mr. Adams, since you're being new, um, the ladies, the ones at Poor Mobility, and our visitors, the new people, are allowed to go first. We're going to set up some tables. Feel free to go into the room and get a plate and put some food on there and come back out and fellowship if you have time to do that. So, Lord, we just come to you now in the name of Jesus Christ and ask you to bless this food, that it would go to the nourishment of our bodies to continue to give us strength and energy to do your will. I pray for your people, God. Bless them. Watch over them. Let the fellowship today be spirit-filled. Let us come together and bond together in peace and in love. We submit our lives to you and say thank you for everything. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.